you know, welcome to our exclusive webinar on the right way to uh, borrow using uh, trust secure collateral. So if this is your first time attending our webinar, yeah, please let us know in the um, chat box by dropping your favorite emoji. And for our returning uh, attendees, we are thrilled to have you. My name is Samalako. I am a trust advisor with Afro Invest Trustees, and I am delighted to be your extinct facilitator for today's session. Um, moving on, I'd like to introduce you to um, other facilitators in each of them bring a wealth of knowledge, yeah, a wealth of knowledge as well as trusteeship. So in no particular order, we have Ebolua Tugobo, um, Chisomo Wobu, and Damilaria Delgun. Together, our facilitators and I will explore the details of the right way to borrow using a trust to secure collateral, giving you valuable insights and physical tips to help you secure collateral while borrowing. Feel free to use the chat box for your questions and we'll address them after the presentation. Uh, without further ado, um, let's dive into it. But before we do, I would just like to give like a backdrop to um, who Afrinvest trustees are. So Afrinvest trustees is a subsidiary of Afrinvest West Africa Limited with over 27 years of, ex um, of excellence specialized in wealth management and trusteeship. We offer tailored solutions to individuals, families and business I like we uh, a team of over 50 years experience combined. Um, Afrinvest Trustees provides um, expertise in resources management and diversification of trustees. So uh, our services are say corporate trust, private trust, and public trust. And it could be uh, customized to say meet your financial goals. Um, so on this slide, we would see that um, so at the end of this presentation, we hope that um, we all take out the importance of collateral and borrowing as well as benefits while of using a trustee, as well as the step-by-step -step process. Then we'll move on to the question and answer session. So the importance of collateral in um, corporate borrowing. So um, typically, a collateral actually refers to assets the borrower pledges to a lender to secure a loan. Say, for instance, a manufacturing company is looking to secure a financing to expand its um, operations to get to get the loan. The company pledges say is um, machineries, inventories as machineries and inventories as um, as collateral. In this means, the company is able to if the company is not able to meet up with its obligation. Yeah, it's if the company is not able to meet up with its obligation, then um, the lender is as well to say. Um, sell the um see the collateral pledge in order to recover the debts this approach actually allows the company access much um much funds needed while the lender is um so corporate loans are generally come in two forms the bilateral loans as well as the syndicated loans uh, bilateral loan is actually straightforward. It's uh, an agreement between one borrower and one lender. This setup is smaller and more flexible compared to that of the syndicated loan. For instance, say a, a tech company uh, wants to secure a, uh, a bilateral loan, he just approaches a single a single bank to, to provide him using his patent or his intellectual property as, um, as collateral for that loan. On the flip side, we see the syndicated loan, which involves, say, multiple lenders, typically coordinated by the lead bank or a lead issuing house, coming together to fund a single borrower. This type of loan is often used by large corporations needing significant uh, or large uh, fundings. Um, a perfect example would be a global airline that might want to acquire a syndicated loan to purchase new aircrafts. Um, so you'll be using is the new aircraft as as collateral for that. So, um, but the the complexity would be several banks or the issuing houses contributing to the funding. These clients would have the same rights to the the collateral. Uh, on the current slide that you can see uh, here, we can observe the risk involved in collateral management. Um, collateral management actually poses several risks. Um, for both the lenders and the borrowers. Some of the risks are, say, uh, asset depreciation. Um, the value of an asset takes 
take for example machinery vehicles reduces their uh, effectiveness over time if the collateral draws below the loan amount the lender might say require additional assets to secure the loan for instance a logistics company might be using their delivery trucks as uh, a collateral to get around as and as a result if the truck say depreciates over time, the um, lender in this case is uh, at liberty to reach out to the to the borrower to request for more um, more assets in order to cover the loan given. Then we have the legal and regulatory risk. This is unique as the collateral management can involve complex legal and regulatory requirements, especially in say cross border transactions. Failure to uh, address these properties can lead to delays or loss of the collateral rights. A clear example would be, say, a pharmaceutical company pledging its assets in different countries and might face challenges from the local laws of this company, of these countries, to, to um, local laws of the countries here, to, and that results in to, say, loss of the assets or those of the, the uh, collateral in this question. So uh, the other risk involved in collateral management would be say that of the market risk. For me, this is a major risk because in um, past transactions, the collateral involved in unique or less um, liquid assets, such as um, say specialized equipment or real estate, lenders may find it difficult to sell yeah, quickly or at fair value if there's a case of a default. Yeah, that's why often and most times lenders tend to request for near liquid assets like treasury bills, bank guarantee, or stocks. For example, a a mining uh, a mining company with rare machineries um, pledging those their rare machineries as collateral. Yeah, if in the case of a default, if in the case of a default, um, the lender wants to dispose of this uh, of the rare machineries, they might find it difficult because it's not like. It, could, it can't be compared to like near liquid assets like um, treasury bills and the rest. Um, lastly, we have the operational risk. The proper um, collateral management requires requires ongoing monitoring and regulatory evaluation to of the assets actually pledged. So if these updates are not done, yeah, the um, the risk of under collateralization would be an issue. A good example would be a food company using its um, it's perishable inventories as collateral, which is perishable inventories as collateral. And over time, this um, this tends to lose value. So um, what's advisable is see the they do evaluation uh, regularly to see that um, the value of this collateral still remains at the value of which it was agreed upon. So um, with all that being said, I'd like to take a deep breath and give the floor to my colleague Ebum to walk us through the remaining of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Samuel, for that um, amazing introduction. So my colleague Samuel has you know, um, done a very good justice in trying to um, let us understand uh, what collateral management is, trying to let us um, give us an insight as to the risks you know, associated with collateral management and also the types of um, lending that we have, uh, being it the syndicated lending or, or uh, what have you. But you know, having to understand the role of a trustee when it comes to collateral management, what exactly does a trustee do, right? And um, that's what I'll be taking us through this slide. Um, if you've been attending our previous webinars, you should already be much aware of who a trustee is or what a trustee is, depending on the context, right? So a trustee basically um, is an individual or an organization that is entrusted with, you know, that responsibility of ensuring that assets are well managed of ensuring that you know uh, assets are, are are held on behalf of certain persons for certain reasons and in most cases we refer to um, this scenario as a trustee a beneficiary and then somebody that you know sets up the trust um, but in this sense, you know, we are tending more to a deeper understanding of a much more corporate level as opposed to the private um, understanding of what we have to know to be a trustee. Uh, a trustee here has a fiduciary duty because we're talking about monies, we're talking about lending, we're talking about the borrower, and then we're talking about the lender. So we have to, you know, sort of like 
um, be able to bring that trustee to the point where they are held responsible to ensure that assets are properly are properly managed for that collateral management purposes. And that is why you'd see that you know trustee play a very uh, important neutral role, a unique role as 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 neutral third party agent in such transaction. And this is because you have two parties that are coming to say, okay, I need some amount of money, and another party is saying, I'm available to give you that money. The party coming to say, I need this amount of money is ready to put down the collateral. Now, some people would not be comfortable with, you know, given the lender, the collateral, and that is where the trustee comes in. The trustee comes in as that middleman, that party that holds the collateral for the sake of either the borrower or the lender. And should there be a case of default, which we will tend to see in much previous slide, um, um, in the much next slide, you will tend to understand that, you know, the trustee also has a duty to ensure that if there's a case of default, um, the collateral is realized or sold off, depending on whatever the case is. And if, you know, all obligations are met, then the collateral reverts back to the borrower and then the lender gets the money plus the interest for which he has um, lent the lender. So, you know, how do we then see trustees acting as neutral parties in such scenarios, right? Um, trustees act as neutral parties because this neutrality allows them to be unbiased. This neutrality allows them to say, okay, you know what? We do not owe any of you loyalty. Whether or not you have an affiliation or you know the buyer, um, the borrower, or you know the lender as a trustee, you have that um, unique responsibility to sit on the fence and not to take sides and that is why you know as a trustee um that's that regulation that you're being bound by because as a trustee you're bound by you know the circles you're bound by the trustees act you know there are so many laws that are preventing you from going out of your ordinary work of scope and that is why it is very important that you know as a trustee you manage this asset fairly and um, responsibly for all parties right so for example like i said if there's a simple loan arrangement there's a the borrower and there's a the lender. Mr. A wants to, you know, access about 50 million from Mr. B and he says, okay, you know what, I have this piece of land, but I don't want to give you this piece of land because obviously you may do something with it depending when the loan agreement is realized or terminated. And that is where the trustee comes in. The trustee comes in and holds that piece of land for the sake of uh, 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 the lender in the in the instance that the borrower is not able to meet up with the uh, obligations and also to also serve as you know a peace of mind for the borrower knowing that this property is with somebody that cannot um, um, do anything shady with the property unless there is a need for you know such property to be sold off in order for the lender to realize his funds so what are the benefits that comes with using a trustee for your collateral or your loan agreement or your borrowing agreement, whatever terminology you may choose to use. There is that effect of enhancing borrower and lender confidence. Like I said, as a borrower, you want the confidence that, okay, if I am giving my property for this particular transaction, I want to be able to, you know, have that peace of mind that nothing would happen to my property pending the lifespan of the transaction to when the transaction is uh, or matured or realized. And then as a lender also, you also want to have that confidence that, okay, if I'm giving out a sum of money, I also want to have something that if I'm not able to get my money back in cash from this old person, I want to be able to realize my money either from the sale of the assets of um, the borrower or from whatever arrangement that you've had in that particular um, uh, collateral management agreement. And that is why, you know, the essence of a trustee in such arrangements cannot be overemphasized, really. There's also the effect of, you know, having a streamlined resolution process in case of default. And that is where a trustee also comes in because before the parties even um, reach the point of where they have to exchange hands in the sense of cash exchanging for trans uh, for assets, there are already pre-agreed terms. The trustee is already from the loop, is in the loop from the very onset of the transaction. And that is why, Right from the beginning of the transaction, all processes are defined, all processes are streamlined. If there is a case of default, this is what we are going to do. If there is a case in which, you know, all parties have met their obligations, this is what we are going to do. So that process is already streamlined. The, um, the trustee has used the professional experience to ensure, you know, that um, um, in any way that the case swings, either party is secure, either party is safe. And, you know, that leads us to another benefit of protecting the interest of all parties. A trustee is neutral. A trustee is independent. A trustee is, 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 is um, fiduciary bound, you know, to observe his duty. So 
all parties, regardless of whether you are a borrower or whether you are the lender, the trustee has the fiduciary duty to uphold your interest. So regardless of whether or not Afri Invest used to maybe do transactions with Mr. A or Mr. B as an account with Afri Invest, Afri Invest trustees has no business with all of that. What Afri Invest trustees had is the terms of the loan agreement, is the collateral which is being used in um, exchange for you know the loan that has been received. And that is protecting the interest of all parties. So you can see that there is, you know, an assurance of confidence. Confidence is being instilled in either parties and then their interests are also more protected. There's also the issue of legal and financial security. As some of you mean, you know, those of you that have dealt with trustees, you would be much aware that um, most trustee organizations, they comprise of, you know, well-equipped professionals, individuals with outstanding um, uh, financial and legal background. And that's also an added advantage because, you know, a trustee being in your transaction or your collateral management agreement helps you because we are able to also, you know, look into the agreement, see where a party might be tend to unbiased, um, might be tend to bias or a party might be trying to like, you know, favor itself over the other party. And with the legal and, you know, financial experience that a trustee has, a trustee can make certain recommendations, right, as regards that agreement. So there is that security, there is that um, legal backing, the um, their loan agreement, there's a collateral in place, you know, everything is well defined so that it leaves no lacuna for, you know, guesses or uh, what have you. So it's not a case of, oh, okay, uh, what if, what if. Things are already defined. There is already a term sheet, there is already a collateral agreement, there is already a loan agreement, you know, depending on whatever structure that um, you are trying to, to take on, right? So that the advantages of um, using the trustee in managing collateral. We've seen the benefits and now we're trying to also look at the advantages. Why, why are we so pertinent about you, you know, using the trustee as a collateral? Some of us before this webinar, we probably wanted to maybe, uh, let's say, access a loan from a particular person and we've um, been a little bit skeptical about having to give our assets directly to such persons. It's a good thing that you're here on this webinar now because we're trying to give you a much more easier, uh, securitized way for you to be able to, you know, you still get access to these loans while having your collateral protected. So there's that issue of risk mitigation. With a trustee, you've mitigated all risks because as a borrower, there's the risks that, okay, if I give my property to somebody in exchange for money, before I even pay back the loan, the person might have sold off the property. Right. For the lender, there's that risk of, oh, OK, if I give up my money to somebody and then the person doesn't pay back, how do I get the money back? So there is that balance between both parties where you have the borrower and you have the lender and then the risk has been mitigated with the use of a trustee. Speaking of efficiency, I cannot even exercise that. Like I said, trustees are professionals. They are well seasoned in such affairs. So. If there is, for example, um, um, a, a breach in obligation by the borrower, the trustee moves swiftly against the collateral. There is no uh, sense of, oh, okay, I am sorry, I'm sorry, please, please, please. The terms are well defined. I mean, in some cases, the lender may be quite magnanimous to say, okay, um, I want to probably give you two more months to pay, but that's up to the lender. For the trustee, his duty is to ensure that as long as the borrower has defaulted in um, 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 paying back the loans or, uh, or the funds collected at a particular time, the trustee moves efficiently to enforce the collateral, to enforce and realize that, you know, the collateral is sold off and the funds are um, given back to the lender so that all parties are happy, all parties' um, rights are being protected. And I'm seeing professional management here again. You know, I'd say that trustees, be it an organization, be it an individual, they are experienced professionals. They are persons that, you know, um, for example, African University trustees, cumulatively, there are over 50 years experience across board when it comes to, you know, the persons administering such transactions. So, you know, 
you are also well assured that okay because of it is a professional that is managing this asset because of it is somebody that i know that is well seasoned in this area that is managing this asset my assets are safe so you do not want to probably just say oh okay um i have a friend he's a lawyer um he should ordinarily be able to you know administer this no yes in as much as you will see most trust organization comprising lawyers. Unfortunately, it is a much more, you know, um, um, separate niche from the usual practice. So that's why it is essential for you to be very intentional about, you know, who you are bringing in to help you manage these transactions, to help you manage these collaterals, right? I cannot even overemphasize that bit. So there's that bit of also enhanced trust and credibility, right? With a trustee, License by SEC, all regulators are on their neck. It is impossible for them to do anything that is out of the ordinary. There is that trust. And then there's the credibility that you also have with, you know, Afro-Invest trustees also being a, a, a subsidiary of Afro-Invest uh, West Africa, which has more than 27 years in the game. And then what have you. So there is that, you know, credibility and trust that comes with it. And, you know, I... I I really want us to take this as our um, takeaways when we're also leaving this webinar that a trustee is the most effective way for you to, you know, have a very, very structured collateral management argument. And on this note, I'll be handing over to my colleague, um, Damilari Adeogu, who will be taking us through um, the other parts of uh, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, you bring quite an uh, interesting perspective to um, our webinars. Um, thanks so much for all that detail, all that interacting to our, uh, you know, the CD, you know, uh, getting a loan, um, both syndicate and um, and um, bilateral. So what I'm going to be doing right now is walking you through a comparison between syndicated and and um, what's it called between syndicated and um, bilateral loans without necessarily you know emphasizing a preference right it's not to say which is better which is um what's it called which is worse right it's for you to understand that these are just two different um kinds of um loans right uh so without much ado uh, i'm going to be giving you you know differences based on certain lesson metrics that have been um established so talking about the borrowing structure right a bilateral loan involves, you know, a single lender, a single borrower. In certain instances, you can have multiple lenders, but it's seen as individual and separate loans. So, for example, um, this year, I take a loan from Bank A, right? Um, let's say my collateral is worth $10 billion and I take a loan of $2 billion. The next six months, I can decide, okay, I need uh, maybe for working capital needs or um, financing um, a new, uh, getting a new asset, right? I can decide to take another loan from Bank B. Right. So the same collateral will be used for those lenders, but it will be recognized as separate um, facilities. While in, you know in a syndicate in a syndicated facility, what you have is one borrower and multiple lenders. Now the multiple lenders can um the multiple lenders, I mean, they, they are coming together to finance a project or you know, finance the company. On um or whatever it, it, it needs the funds for maybe a kind of service diary or you know um funding and funding a project right they come together and the loan is seen as one loan okay so remember what I said in bilateral you have one lender one borrower right even if you have multiple um lenders it should be seen as separate so a lender a borrower a lender same borrower another lender same borrower but in a syndicated it is one borrower and multiple lenders seen as one transaction. Okay, so in terms of the role the trustee um, plays as collateral manager, um, the trustee holds the collateral for the individual lenders in the bilateral loan, right? So um, yes, it might be say, it might be one asset or multiple asset. It really doesn't matter. It's created into a trust. All the trust sounds like a hub, into which each of those lenders connect. So longer as the value of the collateral is sufficient to accommodate that loan, right? But in a syndicated facility, we hold those assets recognizing the transaction as a whole, right? So, um, for example, a bank B in a syndicated loan cannot just cannot say, okay, what's the portion of my um, 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 collateral in, in, in the secured assets, right? It's basically the portion of your exposure. If you brought, brought in 20% of the 
of the large sum, it means they are going to be covered for that um, 20%. But in our records, basically, we are covering the entire 100% for the entire loan, not necessarily um, distinguishing, distinguishing um, each lender's, um, what's it called now, each lender's exposure, per se, the seen as a whole, right? And then in a um, security, in a, when it comes to regulatory compliance, right, for bilateral loan, it's a little easier because, you know, fine, you have things like um, um, single, um, or, or single obligor limits, Right, where a bank cannot give more than, say, for example, 20%, 20% is the mark, is the mark, where you can give more than 20% of your shareholders' funds to um, a borrower, right? In a bilateral, in the bilateral loan, the loan amounts are not usually very significant, so it's easy to, you know, um, adhere to that, um, to that rule. But in a syndicated um, facility, where the, the the sums involved are much larger, right, and um, it might mean that for a bank, Right, it might exceed their single obligor limit, so that necessitates that you know it changes the whole um, regulatory what's it called um, cover. Right now, the the clauses that um, that um, involves you know syndicated loans would you know be different from what um, is involved in a uh, bilateral loan. Right, uh, for example, um, one of the, the rules my my the regulation might state that I'm not sure regulation it might just also be a risk policy thing. The re regulation might state that. Um, if um, there was one transaction that was actually handled where um, the, um, the the loan was non-performing, right? So it was a decision between, you know, um, say rolling over or kind of refinancing in, a, in, in that sense and declassifying, declassifying the, the loan as a non-performing loan. And you can't have one party declassify and another party roll over. If everybody, if one party is um, declassifying, everybody on that has to declassify. You understand? So those are the regulations that cover um, things like that. And then um, the best, the um, best of accords also, you want to take a look at international standards for uh, banking and bring it into consideration when um, you are um, we're taking a look at the, um, the regulatory landscape of the um, syndicated um, loans. Then um, corporate profiles of the borrower, um, of course, because syndicated loans require much larger um, uh, uh, loan size. So typically, it's usually organized, big organizations that usually require that um, loan size. While um, bilateral is usually common among um, small, smaller or mid-sized um, companies. And you know, if it's, you know, usually if it's funded, being funded for a project, right? The, um, for example, the, the transactions you call maybe say a reserve based lending, right? Where maybe um, I'm getting an oil well in a particular um, block, and I'm using the reserve of oil in that block as collateral. Right, so part of the um, uh, what's it called requirement to be um, getting an assessment on the actual value of the reserve. Right, if you are getting a loan of say, spanning over, over a period of ten years, yeah, and um, estimation shows that the, that reserve will be depleted by say year five, you see that you have you already have issues uh, when it comes to um, to those. So it's it is best that you are able to match your um, um, loan to whatever collateral will be um, brought into play. So, um, and then going on to uh, dispute resolution and interest alignment for a bilateral loan is and it's pretty straightforward. I have an issue, maybe I'm there's a delay in payment. I have a commercial with my lender. Um, it's one on one. Um, we decide okay, you have a five day grace period and make payments. But in a syndicated loan, you have lenders with different and different risk profiles. I can maybe for bank A. If you default on the day you're supposed to pay, right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to, loan supposed to be declared the default. Maybe grace, grace periods are not usually allowed. It's already on typical not allowed grace period. But let's say it's grace period for a bank A, grace period is five days. For another bank, grace period is like 10 days or 30 days. You understand? So those differing, um, uh, will I say, policies can result in disalignment of interest. And I mean, what the security trust basically does is try to see how we can. Um, um, Find a middle ground to meet um, to meet in the middle, and usually those kind of um, clauses are usually in imprinted into the transaction documents. This um, security trust did, or what the grace period should be, and I mean that we follow, right? In, irrespective of the individual bank's bank's preference, rather. So, um, so going on to um, a, a case study of um, say a, a case study of a large um, energy company in West Africa, you know. Thinking about a sort of about fifty million dollars for a syndicated loan, right? You 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 need to understand that um, some a bank can give 
um, $50 million to a client. It's really not an issue, but the, the restriction and the risk element is what usually necessitates a syndicated loan in some instances. So even if I have the 50 million, do I want to risk if if this loan goes bad, it could ruin the bank um, permanently. So you know, the bank can say, you know what, let me reach out to other um, lending parties. So what you have there is a lead arranger, that bank reaching out to other parties, you have a, a other bank that is a lead arranger. And then, you know, they came in this instance, I said, we're getting um, other banks to come, co-finance this facility to form a syndicate. And, um, you know, um, the energy sector is one that usually, that usually faces a lot of um, regulatory oversight. I mean, because it's such a um, such a unique um, uh, industry. For some industries, for example, agriculture, and um, I think maybe some other special industries that the government has interest in, they might um, um, have some interventions that require that the bank reduce the um, interest rates um, involved. Maybe they maybe they just require that the bank um, it reduces, but they actually um, intervene and discount the interest that um, that you know the, the industry can access those loans. So those are things that you know are brought into the um, context of um, that industry. It's an energy um, industry, yeah. only that sector, and um, they needed the um, funds to uh, for um, for fund of the project and. Like I said, it exceeded the capacity of one lender. They had to bring in other lenders. Um, now, what would have what would have been if the trustees were not involved, if they didn't have a security trust? What would have what would the transaction have been like? You'd have had multiple stakeholders with different risk profiles. Like I explained, um, it would have been for one difficult to harmonize. Um, you won't have a central party that, for example, if I am the lead arranger, right, and I'm saying, okay, the client wants to raise 50 billion. Um, let the let the collateral sit with me. How comfortable would Bank B, Bank C, and Bank D be if you have just four lenders? That if any um, pardon my parlance, if any big happen, right? How likely is it that the bank, the lead arranger, the bank Bank A, would not prioritize you know selling off the asset to satisfy their own exposure before prioritizing the others? What like I mean, the rules can say you can you have to prioritize everyone equally, but would you as the other lender be comfortable leaving your assets in the hands of someone that you know that also, also has an exposure and can or has can actually uh, prioritize their exposure above yours, right? It might not exactly sit down well with you. That is why um, a tr security trustee being brought into the mix is very crucial for the success of the transaction. And then you have regulatory compliance, right? Um, if um, security trustee is not involved, you might not the I mean, so banks have pretty solid legal teams, but you know sometimes if um, there are differing positions among legal teams, it, it's a lot of back and forth. You don't when when such transactions start, you can see, you see a lot of because you know you have for example you have five banks and each of those five banks legal team right actually you know arguing or clauses or what should be what should not be. It can and the you know taking into consideration their um, what's it called their risk exposures or the risk profile. Or, sorry, I brought bigger part of risk policy for each of those banks, it can really complicate. Sometimes you are reviewing documents for months, right? And then you have administrative complexity. Yeah, this is especially on the part of the borrower, right? It would be easy to understand that, okay, I've gotten $50 million. All I'm doing is paying back the interest. I'm not worrying about, okay, what percentage belongs to what percentage, right? There's another part, usually, in negative transactions called the um, facility agent, right? It's, it's way easy. For the facility agent to um, serve, at, you know, for the facility agent to actually serve as a security trustee is not another a lot of transactions where you have the same party being the security trustee and the facility agent, especially because the interests align. As a facility agent, you are acting as an agent on behalf of the lender and the borrower. As a security trustee, acting as on the interest of the lender and the borrower. So interest align is usually an issue, and it's usually easy when you have somebody that has a collateral just also undo the administrative aspect of it. Um, transaction, but if you don't have a party like that, it's I can tell you for free, it is going to be very cumbersome, right? You have um, each of the lenders trying to reconcile positions. Oh, I sent money on Friday, but the lender is saying the borrower is saying, I ah, know, or bank A is saying, the lead arranger, for example, is saying, Oh, I should done on Friday. Your interest is going to start from um, Friday when I received it. So, those kind of conversations can it can it can really be stifling for the borrower, and that is where the trustee comes into, into place. What is our value had? We unified um, 
I beg your pardon, unified um, collateral management bring the um, the security trust into a hub where every lender can be fully and um, equitably represented. Um, risk reduction and dispute resolution. I do mention that um, we bring in that, um, let's say that balance and that flavor, basically the glue that holds the transaction together. Because you know, you know, if there's any issue, the lender is reaching out to the security trustee, not now disturbing the um, the borrower. And, you know, the security trustee, of course, part of the responsibility of the security trustee, as earlier um, explained, is monitor the um, assets, right? You are ensuring that um, the assets, the value of the assets are par with the value of the um, exposure, right? And then um, enhance regulatory compliance. Having a security trustee, because this is their specialty, they already understand. And usually, a trustee is licensed by the SEC, right? The Security and Election Commission. So it gives a lot of um, regulatory um, understanding and um, makes transaction flow um, effortlessly, basically. Um, outcomes, efficient loan execution and completion, like I explained, they are not disturbing the borrower. Okay, what's, if it's just pay the loan and give the loan and repay, it will be straightforward, but you have some administrative um, in, involvement mid transaction. For example, there might be an audit in the, uh, one of the, um, lend, the lender's organization, and then the auditors are asking you for loan confirmation, um, when payments came in, what are the exposure? As a lender, as a borrower, like, you don't want to start disturbing yourself with all that. So you know what? Just pour it to that security trust or the um, facility agent, and it gives that um, that smoothness. That um, it makes it very demure, if I may say. Okay. Um, efficient loan comp execution and completion. You know, increase borrower focus, like I explained, and streamlined um, interlender communication. So um, these are basically the. Um, Let's say the things you need to know when it comes to comparing uh, uh, bilateral loans and um, syndicated loans. So now I'm going to I'm going to be adding over to my colleague Chisom to take us further in the course of this webinar. Thank you very much, Dami, and then thank you to the facilitators uh, for you know laying a very solid uh, foundation to our conversation today. So quickly because we already have a few questions in the chat box. Um, let's speak on the process. You've listened to the reason why um, it's important to know, to first understand your collateral and also know the options available to you. So what do you need to do now? What is the step? What is the step you need to take now? Um, the first step will be to identify that you need a trustee. Um, if you already don't know that by now, um, you, you should already know that you do need a trustee. And what kind of trustees are you looking out for? For someone who is credible, someone with the experience, and somebody who is a thought leader in the industry. And that's no other than Afri Invest Trustees Limited. Okay, so when you're researching and um, you're trying to select a suitable trustee, you know to select a trustee like ours. Um, very also, also important to begin the communication with the trustee to understand your terms and understand your expectations. Um, very important that um, as a borrower, you first understand your history, your borrowing history. And um, so while speaking to the trustee, you're able to lay those expectations with them. And like Dami has said, um, there could be instances where it could be just, you know, one lender or um, open up the conversations to be able to bring in more lenders to that um, transaction. So having to engage the trustee is a very important first step to take. And uh, like I said, look no further than, you know, Afri Invest Trustees Limited to guide you. Now, what happens after you've engaged the trustee? You start to begin the legal processes. And uh, Ebo so aptly spoke about, you know, the legal processes involved in transactions like this. And that's where you start, you know, having um, conversations around the terms, um, the duties of each party, what are the obligations of the borrower, the obligations of the lenders, and also the trustees. And what happens in that instance? You have a, a body or you have, uh, please, can anyone confirm that you can see my slides, please, so that I can, can someone just put it in the chat box? Okay, so now I, I spoke about what happens next, which would be the documentation and process involved in that. And like I said, okay, great, thank you so much. And like I said, uh, we will have the governing um, agreement, which is called the trustee, it governs the entire process. 
Um, so the obligations of the trustees, the duties of the borrower, the lenders is, you know, enshrined in this document. And, you know, the trustees and every party is duty bound to follow through with each, every single step of the way that has been stated in that, you know, agreement. Now, there are other transaction documents. It could be a mortgage deed, an all asset debenture deed that could be, you know, signed. Um, and, you know, all of these documentations needs to be, and puts into place, you know, to cover all basis points, you know, that is, you know, dynamic to each transaction. Very, very important. Now, what happens next would be compliance with regulatory uh, requirements. And as Dami has mentioned, a trustee that is uh, regulated and um, regulated by the SEC is somebody who you need to be working with. Uh, if you don't have that, it means that they are not duty bound to handle compliance and regulatory requirements. But now if you have a trustee like ours, it is, you know, it is more most important to ensure that those transactions are within you know, the confines of regulations. Now, also laws and uh, relevant laws are also involved. So it's very important that you have a trustee that has all of that experience to um, handle this now. Record keeping is extremely important. You know, in, in cases where you have various lenders, various parties, various interests, um, imagine a, a trustee not keeping accurate records. It could be a big problem uh, for the lifespan of that transaction. Um, so maintaining the 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 maintaining proper records would help the trustee to give you know proper reporting to the lenders as well as to the borrower yourself um, in case of you know any um, misalignment of terms. Now, what happens, you know, finally in this step is managing the collateral, which is very key, you know, in all of this, very, very key. Now, the trustees handle the monitoring of, you know, the value. That's one of the reasons why in this trans transactions of this nature, the, 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 the collateral is in most cases uh, insured, and that insurance is to the trustees as the first loss payee. Now, that's very important because with that, the trustees is able to monitor the value. And there's very instances in transactions where commodities are the collateral. It's very, very key that the trustees understand and know the value of each of those commodities on a day-to-day -day basis and to ensure that it's still, you know, able and viable to, you know, cover for the lifespan of that transaction and, you know, cover for the facility that has been taken by um, the borrowers from the lenders, you know. If there needs to be a substitution or change or releases, um, you know, the trustees understand that even beforehand and give adequate advice to you, the borrower. And like Ebu has, you know, already gotten deep into what happens when there is a default or there's a breach. The trust deed, like I mentioned, has step-by-step -step, uh, methods um, to handle that. And the trustee is duty bound to carry out its duty on that. If there's a need to sell, if there's a need for the trustee to step into those um, properties or what as it were, they begin to do that immediately and to ensure that you know they protect the, um, the lenders in this transaction. So quickly moving on to what are the best practices for borrowers when using trustees. It's very important that We've spoken a lot about, you know, what the trustees can do, the reason why you should have a trust. It's also important that the borrowers understand um, the best practices when working with the trustee. One of them is understanding the collateral agreements. You as an individual or uh, as a company or um, a leader in a company and you think that, okay, I think it's time for me to, it's time for us as a company to start looking into um, accessing more funds to, you know, to, you know, grow our company and, you know, lead us to where we want to be in terms of our finances and our projection. You have to first evaluate your borrowing requirements and your options out there. And, you know, Dami has spoken a lot about the various options that you can, you can have. Um, also important to know that, you know, where you are right now as a company can, this can be an opportunity to step up to the plates, you know, to come to the capital markets and access funds and, you know, protect yourself and also use collaterals that you might not even know are viable options for you to, you know, um, be able to access a, a large number of, you know, funding for your company. And like we said so far, you know, engaging the trustees for effective transaction management is very key. 
be able to define your assets. You need to know what assets, what assets are. And if you actually have, when you could be sitting on the gold mine today and you have no clue that, you know, that could come in as, you know, a viable option for you and to use that to be able to diversify as a company. So it's very important that borrowers know this. Now mitigating conflicts, like Dami has mentioned, when you have various lenders, you have various lawyers and, you know, various uh, uh, policies and appetites, you know, that's where the trustees come in to address these conflicts, you know, and, you know, make sure that it is addressed from the beginning down to the end of that transaction. Now, what happens as a borrower? How do you collaborate with the trustees to ensure that the transaction starts in a good uh, in a good face and also ends, you know, successfully? It's important that you communicate openly. Now, there have been instances where down the line the trustees should have known certain vital information and it turns out that you know those informations were being withheld and it's you know it's you know limits limits the progress you know so to speak of that transaction so it's very important that you maintain transparent communication and consistent communication with your trustee that's the reason why they've been appointed to you know handle even things that you feel that you don't want to, to share for example, your borrowing history is a very important, you know, information that the trustees need to know. So if, for example, you have various um, um, old lenders that have maybe there are certain paperwork that have not been done in terms of releasing of, you know, those assets, those are the information that the trustees need to do to be able to assist you with, you know, um, assist you with the next step of, of, of handling new or new lenders coming in. Now, like I said, information is key. Now, I've mentioned one very key information that the, the trustees need to know. I also need to know the, the ownership structure of your assets is very key. Some people think that um, the assets belongs to them, but in, in the real sense, it not necessarily belongs to the company. So those are the things that, you know, the trustees need to be aware of and to be able to give you this accurate data would help the trustees and also help you um, when you are stepping in uh, into such transactions now partnering effectively and um, working together for you know collateral oversight i've mentioned um you know when it comes when, when it comes to valuing the asset when it comes to managing the assets um you have um some cases where the borrower is a bit you know tense with you know being the trustees being involved in you know, knowing what happens in the collateral or etc but you know that's that should not be the case the trustees begins in these transactions are in most cases, an equitable owner of those transactions, of those collateral. So it's very important that they have that oversight and there is a partnership between you, the borrower and the trustee to, you know, manage and ensure that the collateral is safe, maintained and um, secured. Now, understanding our role is very key. I think that uh, my, my colleagues have been able to explain what our role is. You have to be aware of our responsibilities. Now, there are responsibilities where the, the trustees have to distribute funds, you know, both interest and principal, back to the lenders. And some, so you see in some cases where the, the borrower is a bit skeptical about that, but that is one of the major roles of the trustee, to be able to distribute those funds back to the lenders and also to handle the management of the asset and compliance with relevant regulation. So at this point, uh, I want to thank you so much for sticking with us and we would open the floor uh, for various questions and answers. Um, thank you very much. And, um, and I yield the floor to Dami to handle this portion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Chisum. Uh, for a very wonderful session. So um, those are very pressed for time. I'm going to be jumping into um, question and answer sections. I'll pick out some questions. Um, again, for those if those of you that are joining us for the first time, we share the slides, we share the recording of the seminar, of the webinar, I beg your pardon. So if um, your question is not answered, um, uh, please, you can, this is our contact detail on the screen right now. You can just send an email to any of these um, emails or um, trustees at afroinvest.com. Okay, um, so this person says, um, uh, could you please advise on, on your target customer for this service? Do you offer service to SME or only large um, corporate organizations? Um, well, we it's a thing of, it's a conversation that we can have. Do not, um, you have to message us. You, I don't know what size of company you are, talk, you are referring to, right? I don't know what your... Uh, revenue is what size of collateral that you have so it's a conversation you can always have with us just reach out to us and um, we can take it up from there 
Um, this for instance, what type of collateral can I use with Afriinvest trusts? Can I use my stock portfolio with Afriinvest as collateral? So here's the deal, right? As much, um, please, we're going to need you to use the question and answer section. Um, I see that a lot of people are raising up there and we might not be able to um, take on, you know, um, attendees, um, have attendees speak right now because we're pressed for time. So please just use the question and answer section. So um, in terms of the type of portfolio um, of asset you can use, it really depends on the lender, right? Um, we Yes, stock portfolio has been seen to um, be used as collateral in um, certain assets. Um, a lot of rich people even do it, right? They use the stock portfolio as, as a leverage to get um, get a loan, right? So yes, it is possible, but you know, it's, question, it's a question of what's the value of the um, stock portfolio. And then once there's a... Um, once there's a reduction, once there's a, maybe a reduction in the price, right, and it exposes the lender, there's going to be a margin call, and you're going to have to supplement um, the either the stocks or the cash, right, or um, make the uh, the lender whole. Okay. Um, so, what type of collateral? The same question. Yes, um, and you can use any collateral stock, um, land. But what we've seen is, you know, landed property, machineries. Um, as someone said, you can buy a get a loan for to get a, to buy a, a machinery and then use the machinery as um, collateral, right? So um, it's so long as the lender is comfortable with that, yeah, you are good to go. Uh, um, okay, so this person says, um, okay, so this question, can an individual have access to a trustee which can help facilitate loan pro uh, process for projects? Um, so I would need to express um, explicitly that uh, ours is not um, ours is not to get you the loan, right? Ours is to ensure that the collateral is in place and is in a neutral um, is in the hands of a neutral party. And this is why this is important. Is if we have seen situations where you know an organization gives um their collateral to say a bank and then they want to get loan from another bank maybe another bank is offering them cheaper right but the existing bank is delaying the process okay you're supposed to um share collateral with the new bank but okay so they send you email you take five okay this respond right um they try to call you or not so it can stifle the process and they might decide that you know what let us give you the notice of getting from another lender but what if the lender is giving you at a cheaper rate right and what if you are trying to just um Diversify your relationship with banks, right? So that's why having it in the, in the custody of a neutral party gives you that leverage, right? It's something you want to. Um, so can you take pension as collateral? No, we cannot take your pension as collateral. You can't use your pension as collateral. Um, your pension is sealed until um, either until you are, I think you retire or until you're out of job for a couple of months. I can't remember right now. Uh, but no, we cannot use a pension as collateral. Um, Okay, um, can I get a loan? We already expressed we do not, uh, we're not responsible for um, getting you the loan as is to maintain the collateral. Uh, what happens if a trust dies? If a trustee dies, as beneficiary always, um, so this is with respect to um, a private trust. Um, if um, you're talking about um, this conversion, we just add. If anything happens to the trustee, a new trustee can be appointed. For example, if uh, the trustee packs up, right, they usually um, bought over by another trust company or another financial, financial services company. So the transactions continue their legacy, or continue to run, right? But if um, as a um, as a um, settler of the trust or the lender, you can always replace your um, trustee. It's a lengthy process, but yes, it's doable. Um, my collateral is 10 billion and the fund is 2 billion. At default, will the borrower get his balance? Yes, the borrower will um, get their balance. Okay, so this is as much questions as we can take right now because we're very pressed for time. Um, like I said, the record will be sent to you, the slides will be sent to you, and our email addresses are right on display right now. So you can just jot them down. I'll give you give like 30 seconds to just jot it down. Take a screenshot if you have to. Uh, I want to say a very big thank you to everyone that has joined this webinar so far. For those of you that have been with us from the start of the year, you joined our Q1, Q2, Q3 webinar. Nowadays, we say a very big thank you. We cite you. We hail you. Very demure, very cutesy. All right. Thank you very much. See you on our Q1 2025 webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.